Right, welcome back, everybody. Um, thanks for coming back. Um, we've got a brilliant panel to kick us off for the final section of the day. Um, and it's kind of returning to a question uh, that we asked earlier. What if uh, investment was rooted in recognition of where wealth has been generated? What if we saw it as a tool to build the future we dream of? Um, so I'm really, really delighted to have Steph Robbie here um, to chair the panel. She'll introduce uh, her colleagues in a minute. Um, so Steph is the founder and chief executive of the Good Ancestors Movement. Having spent a, a career as a city tax lawyer, is that right? Well, private wealth lawyer. Um, so brings a perspective from lots of different uh, places. Um, so yeah, thank you, Steph, and over to you. Thanks, Sophia. Am I on? Am I on? Can you hear me? Great. You, you never really tell. <laughs> um, anyway, it's really, really good to be here. And um, yeah, I can hear myself now. Um, yeah, it's really great to be here with our fabulous um, panel who I'm um, very honoured to be sharing the stage with and will introduce very shortly. But um, as Sophia explained, I'm the founder and CEO of the Good Ancestor Movement, having spent a decade in the belly of the beast in the city of London, um, advising uh, individuals and families on their wealth stewardship and typically anchored in the idea of um, preservation and accumulation. And I blew up my legal career and did a massive 180. And now I support individuals and families um, with an approach to wealth stewardship, which centers redistribution and centers the embodiment of the regenerative economy. And we're going to come on to talk about that in a moment. Um, now, this um, the one point I wanted to raise first is the title of this panel, Next Generation Asset Holders, Regenerative Wealth Stewardship. I, that may have kind of evoked ideas of um, very young uh, custodians of wealth. Typically, when we think about next generation, we're thinking about young people. But actually, I wanted to highlight the fact that this isn't exclusively about young people and their attitudes towards wealth stewardship and uh, new investment approaches. And it's more about an emerging generation of, of individuals across all generations who are united in their mission and purpose, really to pursue alignment um, and to build an economy um, that is both regenerative and distributive by design, to quote um, the wonderful Kate Rayworth. So um, we have uh, this afternoon Lily Lewis, um, Catherine Howarth, Rebecca Gowland, and Noni Makuyana. Um, and uh, we're going to be having a, a bit of a discussion uh, really about setting the context. I'll, I'll start by setting the context, really, of um, why we wanted to have this panel and, um, and share some ideas about regenerative wealth stewardship and what that means or what it should mean in this current context. I talked uh, uh, briefly about the idea of um, moving beyond philanthropy, um, which is part of the, the dominant economic system that, you know, we, that we are all part of, that we have inherited, um, and moving towards this more integrated and holistic model of um, regenerative wealth stewardship, which seeks to embody an economy um, which is fundamentally regenerative. So much of the work that we all do is grounded in um, a political analysis of, of the extractive economy and the need to um, support a just transition towards a regenerative economy. And that demands the need to transform our systems of economy and governance. Um, and within that framework, um, specifically, much of our work um, is grounded in the, the strategy framework for a just transition developed by Movement Generation and the Climate Justice Alliance. And, um, and, and within that framework, there are different approaches that can be employed um, to, to which, which affect the way that we steward capital in the economy. And the first of those approaches is really the idea of resisting. So the work that seeks to fight back against oppressive and unjust and unsustainable economic systems. And then the approach of building, so building new systems. We, we know that the work of Emerging Futures is really looking, kind of highlighting the urgency, the need to build new systems that are going to serve us beyond the 21st century and to build systems which are rooted in equity, sustainability and justice. And so I wanted to start <laughs> with our current context, if we could just begin to place ourselves um, in the current context of the economy and specifically around the role of wealth and the role of capital and what it's doing and where it came from. And I'm going to start with Rebecca 
Um, and um, she is best placed to speak to where we are now in our economic system and to contextualise some of these discussions about what regenerative wealth stewardship should really be looking at. So over to you, Rebecca. Thank you, Steph. Um, yes, thank you so much for uh, having me. Um, I, I work for an organisation called Patriotic Millionaires. Uh, on their international work and then have, I'm, I'm establishing the UK chapter as well and if you haven't heard of what they do um, we were set up in 2010 by a woman called Erica Payne who is a political strategist and communications expert in the United States and uh, she was incensed by the fact that Obama was extending a tax cut for millionaires um, completely kind of unbelievably to her and she was so angry about it she um, got all of her very very wealthy friends from the DNC to sign on to a short letter that essentially said do not cut our taxes we do not need our taxes cut raise our taxes that is the right and the patriotic thing to do and essentially that letter went viral in the media um, attracted a ton of attention and contributed to the reversal of that policy and ultimately is the founding kind of document, I suppose, of what is now a 200 strong membership organisation in the United States um, with a founding mission, really, to use the voice of wealth to address the destabilising impact that economic inequality has, not just on the United States, um, not just on the UK, but on the world. And we do that through the structural systemic issues that are at the heart of the political economy and those the kind of three pillars we talk about three pillars the first is progressive taxation at the minute we're living in a world where taxation really focuses we, we focus on three things consumption income uh, and in this country national insurance right so that when we think about tax the general public thinks about those three things we think progressive taxation means that very wealthiest people take a larger receipt of the of the tax bill. So the wealthiest people, the wealthiest corporations, and the way that it is designed at the minute is wrong. It's completely skewed. The second pillar of the political economy is around how we reward work rather than continuing to reward capital, rewarding shares. And I'm sure, Catherine, you'll talk a lot more about that um, later on. So there's kind of the progressive taxation uh, aspect, ensuring that we reward work rather than capital, ensuring that we reward, reward all stakeholders rather than just shareholders and then the third kind of systemic issue or the structural issue that's a real problem with our politi political economy is political capture essentially we believe we know that wealth holders continue to buy the influence of our politics and our politicians and in doing so they exert huge levels of influence over policy design that policy design then continues to allow wealth to accumulate in one place so those three pillars are the structural kind of factors in our political economy that need to change and as I said this isn't just an issue in the United States or in the UK, it is a global issue. Pre-pandemic, we were living in a world where half of the global population lived on $5.50 a day or less, which is a complete pittance, um, with a huge number of people living in extreme poverty, so under $1.90 a day. Since the pan uh, well, and, and, and actually even before the pandemic, we were seeing the levels of extreme, in, extreme poverty growing. Since the pandemic, Oxfam reported in January that We've, we've seen the 10 richest men double their fortunes through the course of COVID, whilst 99% of humanity have seen their incomes fall. That, and that, to me, is a stark reminder of the fact that a, a very valuable resource, which is money, is sitting in the hands of a very few at the top, and everybody else is paying the price for that, and that is a problem. Um, in the UK, that's kind of mirrored, so we, we're seeing that here too. In, I mean, May, kind of Sunday Times Rich List brought out their, you know, their uh, assessment of where the money is sitting in the UK. We have 177 billionaires in the UK this year. That is up from 29 in 2010. So a huge kind of increase of wealth in one place. Their wealth is increasing, it increased by 8% to 710 billion. So that's, that's, that's happening at the same time that millions of families are facing the worst cost of living crisis in 40 years. And the government is raising taxes on their work. It isn't raising taxes on the wealth of those 177 billionaires. 
huge problem. So this, this fantastic group set up in the United States in 2010, in the UK, we felt last year there was a real need for the positive voice of wealth holders to contribute to this conversation. The need for wealth holders in the UK to be taking positive action, to use their voice to say, hang on a minute, our economy is skewed, our economy is wrong, and we need to redress the balance. It is imbalanced at the minute in favour of us. Um, and so we started back in, in, in January last year with six founding members of Patriotic Millionaires UK. We now have 15 members who meet every month to talk about how we deliver our political strategy, how we deliver our media and communication strategy. Our work is fundamentally about how we advocate for change. It's not about kind of how we raise money for change, it's about how we use the voice of wealth to proactively talk about how we need to change our economic system so that it benefits ordinary people. Um, and then we have like an extended network of people who are happy to kind of engage with flagship, flagship projects. And it's not just inherited wealth that is a part of the organisation, it's economists, traders, entrepreneurs, lawyers, a whole mix of people who are who are essentially saying, well, enough is enough, and we recognise that the point for change is now because accumulated wealth in one space is just, it's reached kind of the end of the line. We can't continue to act in the way that we are acting. And so they work to raise their voice with whoever will listen to them to change our economic system. That's primarily in the media and with politicians at, at parliamentary events and directly with MPs. Um, our key aim, or the key policy that we think is a real linchpin for transforming the debate, or is a kind of pro good proxy for transforming the debate, is the introduction of an annual wealth tax. Now, that's one thing, but we will we embrace any and all interventions that tax wealth more effectively. So it's not just a wealth tax, it's, it's how we tax wealth more effectively so that we can reduce what's here and reduce the gap between the, the rich and, and the, the very rich and the rest. Um, and that is a symptom of the wider problem that we recognise, which is just simply the accumulation of extreme wealth in, in one place. We believe, along with the British public, that that is a problem. It's not just a problem, it's not just a moral problem. I mean, I think it's a moral problem, but it's not just a moral problem. It is an economic problem. It is an environmental problem, and it is a problem for democracy. So we polled the British public back in May about their attitudes to extreme wealth and what they thought about it. And essentially that poll came back and it, and it demonstrated that, I think it's 70% of the British public think that an individual can have too much wealth. 72% of the British public think that extreme wealth buys you political influence. Over half of the British public think that extreme wealth is a threat to democracy. Over half of the British public think that the cost of living crisis is because of the concentration of wealth in one place. This is a huge issue that the British public have, have recognised. We recognise it too, and it's not just that, it's kind of endless research that's happening at the minute to demonstrate that. Steph, you uh, shared with me a really great piece of research from um, Natalia BNV Paribas, uh, which effectively says that the UK is the second most unsustainable economy out of 36 major economies. And that is down to high housing costs, high childcare costs, and the huge wealth inequality that we see in this country. And their assessment on the back of this research is what we're going to face in this country is the provocation of civil unrest. People cannot keep going like this in this economic system. It is not sustainable. Something has to give, something has to change. Um, and I guess really that is the point of what we're doing. The point of this organisation is to encourage wealth holders to speak out because it is a voice that has been missing for decades in the, in the conversation around wealth inequality. So we work in any and all um, spaces that will listen to us around redressing the imbalance. Um, and we do that because unfortunately for our democracy, wealth holders, people with money, and power are listened to way more than voting publics. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Rebecca, um, <coughs> for outlining all of that. And I'm mindful of time, so I'm going to move on to Nonny very shortly, but I don't want to miss the opportunity to reflect something that um, you mentioned, I heard you say last month, or maybe the month before, and it hasn't, I've been spreading it around everywhere. And when asked to describe taxation and the role of tax, I mean, it probably feels a bit strange to be talking about taxation at a philanthropy conference, but this is critical at this time. And you describe tax 
as an investment in the Commons. Mm -hmm. And I, I want people to hear that, an investment in the Commons. And just really super short so that we can move on to Nonny, but I just want you to explain, what is your vision of what what's, sits behind that? Why is tax an investment in the Commons? Because it provides our shared services. And I don't, when I say services, I don't just mean like our hospitals and education. I mean our roads, our infrastructure, the legal services that we should all be entitled to. It provides the very basis, the fundamentals of our, of our society. I do, I want to talk about Blackpool a little bit, but I won't, I'll hold it back, cause, but we'll come back to Blackpool we'll and, and, and... We'll come uh, back, let's yeah. to Blackpool. Um, Nonny, um, maybe you could, you know, we know where we are now, maybe you could take us a little bit back and, and start with the origins of extreme wealth accumulation and then maybe go on to share a bit about your practices, how you are employing resist and build strategies in your work. Cool, thank you. Um, hey everyone. Also, my notes are on my phone, so I'm just not texting. I'm actually looking at my phone. Um, so my name is Nonsan Samakuyana, and I'm from um, Decolonising Economics, which is a grassroots um, collective working to build a solidarity economy rooted in racial justice principles. And what we like to start our workshops with is that we would not have an econom the economic system that we have today without the history of slavery and the history of the trade of like, black people's lives and the exploitation of land and labor that belongs to people of the global south. And I think it's really important to start here because lots of the stories we get told about the economy actually don't start there. They tend to be incredibly decontextualized. And I think at Decolonizing Economics, we found when we first started that you know, people talk about inequality, but then they wouldn't place that. Inequality began 400 plus years ago, right? And so how can we think about the problems that we have today without interrogating the financial infrastructure and the ways that it has influenced much of the economy that we exist in today. And so um, I love this quote, which says that history makes the economic relations of today. And I think it's really important to remember this alongside this other quote that I love by um, the brown hijabi who says to decolonize is to contextualize. How can we contextualize the pain and the suffering that is def definitive of the economic system as we see today and how it um, impact people based on their like race and ethnicity and other marginalized um, characteristics. And I think this is also really important to think about the instruments that make up the economic system and where they come from. So when we think even from taxation to, um, you know, like with the, what's it called, the stock exchange, so many of these um, instruments are actually financial instruments that were created through the trade of life, right? And so, um, always like to start from there because it's very, very important. And so um, when we think about like, um, I think it's, yeah, when we think about like reimagining the economic system and working to, away from the extractive system, um, the extractive economic system, we see the functions of the extractive economic system, which are exploitation. And where does exploitation start? through the trade of slaves, right? Because you can work someone for literally without investing anything into that um, relationship and actually can get maximum profit. And we see the same sort of system existing today in how, you know, like with um, casual contracts for like labor, like for example, with Amazon, we see the same types of ways in which like people that actually do the most important work. Like for example, I always think, you know, with the idea that like if you work harder, you're actually, they, we, we get told that if you work harder, you're more likely to have better financial outcomes. But that is just not true, right? And that is a myth that is, um, what's it called, continued by the um, capitalist extractive system. Because if that was true, right, nurses would probably be millionaires. How many <laughs> nurses are millionaires? None, right? And so when we kind of take apart like the sort of like narratives, ideas and attitudes that it takes for us to exist within the system, ideas and narratives that tell us that some people are deserving of their wealth and some people aren't. And this makes me think of our workshops at Decolonizing Economics that we do. So we did this one with Steph called Reimagining Wealth. And we asked the people who were wealth holders, what stories did they get told about why they have the money that they have? And people said that, like, you know, their parents had said, it's because we were smart. It's because we were lucky. You know, it's because we played the game. And 
that's interesting to me because all wealth is stolen, right? Those people who have wealth, that is stolen money from the exploitation of people in the global south. So then what does that mean for those people that don't have wealth? Are we saying that people of color are stupid? Are we saying that people of color don't work hard enough? Are we saying that people of color are, don't have initiative or whatever? And like the ideas, I think, really filter down into how we think about like philanthropy and funding, right? So the idea that people have to ask for money that was stolen from them is actually bizarre to me, one. And two, um, how does that, how do you value something where you actually don't really value the bodies that do that work, secondly? Um, yeah, so that's one of the things that I wanted to say. <laughs> and I think, um, yeah, again, with the ways that the economic system exists, how profit maximization is always put as like the most important thing. And so when, as like in the work that we do at Decolonizing Economics, so I'm talking so fast that my mouth is dry. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, at Decolonizing Economics, when we trace back the stories of wealth and the narratives and ideas that exist behind it, we see the ways in which people of color who are surviving under an economic system that was never meant for them to survive, actually was meant to them to work and to um, continue to build profit for people that hold wealth, right? And so um, with the work that we do, we try and... Um, locate these stories of where money comes from and how money can be moved. And one thing that we notice quite a lot with like funders and with people that have wealth is the idea of like giving, right? How can you give something that's not yours? Question to just leave out there. And um, how then do you value the tools that it takes to create like the world that we're thinking of? And um, a really big part of my work that I really, really enjoy is like uh, we've started this um, project called like economics from the margins which actually locates change and um, e um, economic power in communities of color who have been living and surviving against the capitalist economic system and I think survival is actually how lots of communities of color have innovated right and when we think about new economics we're not talking about anything new we're talking about tools that people of color have been using to ex um, to survive against racism um, and and like the capitalist system. And so I think it's um, really important to locate change there. But then most of the time, when we think of change under this current system, it has to be something new. It has to be something really expensive. It has to be something flashy. It has to be something marketable. But then actually, lots of the people that we work with are aunties and uncles who do something as simple as like making food for their community. That is economic power and that is economic change, right? But then lots of the things that get valued under like the white um, gaze is like work that is actually so removed from communities and actually has no bearing in what change will look like. So I think one of the things that we try and do at Decolonizing Economics is to get people to rethink where solidarity economics happens because it happens already and it exists. And when we think about yesterday, um, I was doing a workshop and we were talking about like building the living economy and someone was like, you know, it's the utopias. These aren't utopias. These things exist already but aren't just valued because of the current system that we live in. Um, and I think this is where like, the idea of like, reparations comes from, because how can we think about building a nourishing and living economy when we don't agree with where money comes from and where wealth comes from, and that's from slavery? What does it look like to change things when we aren't agreeing on the starting points, right? And I think that's a really frustrating thing about organizing in new economics because people treat, um, you know, it's all about like quantitative, it's all about data, and data is useful, love data, but actually people's lives are not something that you can crunch down into numbers, you can't crunch it down into reports, and also who's going to read the reports? People that actually are invested in the harm and perpetuating the cycles of poverty and inequality that um, exist today. And... Um, I think moving away from the extractive economy is also recognizing the ways in which to be part of these um, conversations about funding, about shifting wealth, is also sometimes incredibly extractive to communities of color. How can you want to invest in someone whilst extracting from that person? And I feel like it really takes a lot of like rethinking about how we understand people's um, 
people of color's bodies and how we value them under the current economic system as workers, as you know, people who are disposable because of, you know, like with COVID, we saw people of color were literally being thrown to go and work in the NHS and being paid very little because that's just what is expected, right? We are not, we don't, we don't, we don't have any value. And so I think to be having this conversation is to be rethinking the colonial mindset and how it um, influences how we think about ourselves and how we think about ourselves in relation to other people. And um, also, I think there's something there around like building a living economy, which is about the solid, um, sorry, the plural plurality of approaches that exist within communities of color to solve the problems that we have today. And I think it gets really weird when you're in like white spaces and people are like, whoa, that's so crazy. I never thought about that. People have been thinking about this for centuries. We're not the first people. I'm probably 100% not the first person to say this like ever. And I think it's about like, how can we have an understanding that there's so much that exists out there. It's about how we value it and how we shift power and resources to the people that do the things already. And that's kind of, yeah, that's everything. Thank you, Nonny. Nice. So animated, love it. <laughs> Um, Catherine, I want to come to you now um, because you're the chief exec of Share Action and resistance runs in your organization's DNA. So I'd, I'd love you to share um, some examples, a little bit of background and perhaps some examples of how you are practicing and embodying resistance at, at um, Share Action. Okay. Um, well, uh, it, well I, I really love this resist and build um, framing because uh, I think it's true that at Share Action we are we're really quite quite good at resistance. Um, we run some really cracking campaigns, but one of the things that I've been reflecting on quite a bit recently is that actually, in order to um, achieve really transformational change, we need to be grounded both in um, the world as it is where we need to fight and resist and run really tough campaigns and highlight the injustice and the harm that's done. But we also need to point to the future that we need. Um, and actually, that is something that we, I think, at least in Share Action, we've started to do much more of. I think in general, in civil society and campaigning organizations, we all need to get better at this. And I think that's one of the reasons I'm really excited to be here, apart from the kind of phenomenal range of ideas and thinking, is that I really love that JRF is just thinking, like the very idea of emerging futures is just quite kind of special and unusual. Um, and one thing we, have been doing at, at, at Share Action, or we want to do a lot more of, is really think about, well, what would the finance system look like if it was fit for purpose, if it was genuinely designed not to be extractive, uh, if, if it was genuinely regenerative um, and allowed wealth uh, to be built in ways that actually built uh, people's dignity, um, restored our very damaged ecological systems. Um, we did one little project, um, which a few years ago, and interestingly, it's one of the projects we got, like, we, we couldn't get any funding for it, but we kind of did it anyway, which was to write um, a, a bill of parliament for what uh, we, th we thought the legal regime for investment should look like. We called it the Responsible Investment Bill. And it basically rewrote something called um, fiduciary duties, which are the legal duties that large investors have when they look after somebody else's money on their behalf. And kind of hardwired into it is that if you are responsible for looking after somebody else's money, then you must effectively maximize financial returns. So like hardwired into our entire system really is in the law, this um, kind of extractive um, piece. So we've written a, a, a kind of a bill of parliament which, and it's just the first I think in a piece of work that um, could really take the trouble and, it, and I just want to say that I think this thing about imagining the future is it's really hard work. It really takes effort. It really takes like, deep thinking, standing back, like obviously a really participative conversation but it got me thinking well what, what, what else could we look at? Like what would 
the workforce in the financial system look like in a world in which the finance system was fit for purpose? It would not look like the workforce today in the financial system, which is, by the way, there are, there are more, um, I mean, particularly in asset management, uh, portfolio managers are just overwhelmingly white males. Now, white males can make brilliant, brilliant decisions, but it should reflect the society as a whole. So what would the workforce look like? What would the governance of financial institutions look like? Who would have a say? Uh, who would make decisions? Who would sit on boards and why? Um, what would be the incentives in the financial system that we need in the future? Um, in other words, you know, what behaviours and outcomes would be rewarded because today, the, the behaviours and, and, and um, outcomes that are rewarded are actually just driving us in this sort of really problematic um, direction. What sort of systems of reporting, accountability, um, and, and how would success and failure be defined? So one thing we've been thinking about, which is kind of ex really exciting to um, talk about today and think about, is you know, moving beyond the work that we do, and maybe I'll say a little bit about the campaign we've just run at Sainsbury's for um, to get a living wage, because it's been a kind of a great example of a tough campaign operating in the world as it is, um, and some real lessons learned from that. But to just do more of this work, to put the effort in uh, to describe the finance system we need, because until we do that alongside the resist bit, I don't think we'll create the transformation that is is required. Um, shall I just say a little bit about? If Sainsbury's? you could briefly touch on Sainsbury's, yeah, okay. that would be very. So yeah. we are just like literally a few days since um, Sainsbury's held its annual general meeting, and we have been working for for many many years with investors to encourage the biggest companies in the economy to commit to being accredited living wage employers. And we've had great success with it, but it was like time to take on the big beast, which is the supermarket sector. And by the way, talking about, you know, the pandemic and who worked hard in the pandemic, like when pe we were, you know, many of us were at home in front of screens, sheltering from the risk, people in the, in, in the supermarket sector were out on the front line um, and not paid a living wage, uh, many of them. So we thought that it was the right time, cost of living crisis is in people's minds. And so we filed a shareholder proposal. We amazing group of investors came together. A number of them were in the room. Well done, Legal and General, who were on stage earlier. Um, the biggest fund manager in the UK was part of the coalition. Um, so that was fabulous. Um, there were Sainsbury's workers that were part of co-filing. It was a, it was a really inclusive group. Um, anyway, came to the vote, and guess what? We got 17% of. Uh, shareholders voted in support of the company becoming a living wage employer, which is kind of sounds like a big fat fail and kind of is, although I have to say that just running the campaign forced Sainsbury's to um, raise the wages of 19,000 workers in London who were below the, the current living wage figure. But what's really, really interesting is what we learned a few days ago, which is that um, there's a fantastic little um, social enterprise called Tomello that has developed the tech that basically allows pension savers to say what they would vote on if they were given the choice at one of these uh, shareholder resolution moments. Because, of course, they don't have a choice. It's handed over to a fund manager. 83% of ordinary working people with pension savings in the UK would have supported that resolution, which is like really interesting because it turns out to be you know exact reverse of the 17% in the fund management industry who, who supported it. Um, so it just really goes to show that there's this disconnect between what people at large would like to see happen with their wealth and what people who are looking after it on their behalf are up for doing. Um, and so it's been a fantastic learning experience, this campaign. And although we haven't got, we haven't won everything we want yet and there's so much more to do, um, it's been a good example of resist. Um, but it needs to be matched by, okay, so what have we learned there about how the financial system operates? And how do we turn that into the vision of a better system uh, that we really need? Thank you. Lily, we've got a few minutes left, so you're going to have the last word, last okay. few words. So I wondered if you could share um, what this kind of resist approach has looked like in your own life mm -hmm. and, and how, what is it that you're imagining in terms of how you might contribute to building systems 
um, and then perhaps share a little bit about what you think needs to be resourced in terms of how we build systems and where, where we can be strategic in deploying resources into resist work. Sure. So I guess maybe to be helpful, I'll give you a bit of context on my background. <clears throat> so I work for my family foundation in a subsect of it. It's quite traditional. And so I was able to kind of um, branch out to specialise in working in youth violence and abstinence-based um, addiction treatment with grassroots leaders. And that was my niche for a really, really long time. And I was just kind of focused on that and kind of nothing outside of that um, until I started thinking about systems change as a whole. And I think actually, Nonny, something you were talking about more broadly is the colonial mindset, which is something I really want to touch on. Um, I'm also a wealth inheritor of liquidated assets and different types of assets like that and a shareholder in my family companies. Um, I think the philanthropic system is totally broken. I don't think it works or is kind of fit for purpose. I think there's a lot of reparation that needs to be done in different forms. I think particularly around reflecting and taking responsibility on the colonial mindset that we have and the white gaze and essentially white supremacy within that. And I think a lot of what operates in my experience of that around a, being a wealth holder is my relationship and one's relationship as a whole with control and money and why we want to be giving money away where we can see it and we can see the impact that, that it has to make us feel good about ourselves and essentially our codependent relationships with that and all the really tricky, complex stuff of family dynamics, intergenerational family wealth, ancestral trauma, how the wealth is made and how messed up and corrupt that is and how difficult that often is for wealth creators or wealth holders um, or stewards, as lots of people say, um, to hold the reality that their family really cares about them and has worked very hard and the money that has been made has harmed an incredible amount of people and potentially is actually continuing to do that. And what is it like to actually hold that reality and commit to doing the proper reflective work and practice and be held accountable by the general public uh, rather than splitting and dissociating and just practicing some kind of forms of philanthropy? And so I don't understand why more wealth holders and philanthropists aren't committing to giving as much tax as they can in the UK. It doesn't make any sense. Like, I don't understand. You listen to the people here on this stage and you're like, yeah, it makes total sense. Like, I don't have a background in maths or anything. I work in trauma, <laughs> somatic experiences in prisons. That's kind of what I do. But I don't need to have a background in economics to understand the principles and the values of what these people are talking about is correct. And if we're thinking about systematic change and root causes and you know sustainable approaches and all of this kind of jargon that I think we've been saying a lot today how can we do any of that unless the wealthiest people in our society are committing to pay as much tax as they can am I 100% comfortable with giving lots of my money away to a government I'm not really a fan of no but I think there's an assumption that by committing to do these things that we're comfortable with it and it feels okay for me as a wealth holder, even though my values and principles, I believe that I really need to give away the vast majority of my money and the majority of that will be happening through tax as Steph, her organisation, has been supporting me to work through. It's not something I'm 100% comfortable with personally, but I think it's also really important for wealth holders and people within the sector as a whole to be making space to be processing our feelings around that because I think it's our relationship with control, with fear of letting go, with losing, which is a lot of fundamental issues around whiteness um, as a whole uh, that we really need to be processing and looking at because it's not actually super complicated for a wealthy individual to hire an incredible organization like the Good Ancestor Movement to help them to restructure things. I think it's the feelings around it and the difficult conversations around not splitting and holding the challenging elements and our roles to play uh, essentially within corruption that we don't actually want to be processing and taking responsibility and essentially accountability for. And so I think actually it's, it's quite simple um, <laughs> committing to it as a wealthy person. The feelings around it aren't fun, but come on, like it's, not, we, it, it's what needs to be done. I don't understand why people aren't doing it sooner, really. Thank you, Lily. <laughs> I think um, we're out of time, but um, I, I think that's right, isn't it? We got, yeah. 
Um, so thank you all so much. I, I feel like there needs to be space to continue this conversation in community and we will find a place for that somehow. But I, just in parting, I hope that what's been shared today really um, shows that we've got to completely redefine what investment means in the 21st century and beyond. Um, so thank you all for listening. Thank you all so much. That was brilliant. Um, and I think this resist and build frame is a really uh, useful one uh, to keep on using. At JRF at the moment, we talk a lot about our work to focus on the urgent and the deep. And it feels like a similar mindset of like what we need to do to hold um, government's feet to the fire and others about things that are making things worse now at the same time as building alternatives and showing what might be possible. So thank you very much. Um, we're going to get the next panel on now. So this is a smooth, a smooth transfer. Um, uh, the next panel, um, I'm really pleased um, that it's been uh, co-curated with uh, the Grant Givers Movement um, and uh, Roxanne Nazir from Grant Givers Movement is uh, going to chair it and she's going to be in conversation with a number of people who are seeking to transform uh, the grant giving sector and the wider non-profit sector. So um, uh, we'll bring them up onto the stage now um, and we'll probably run for about 45 minutes for this session and then, um, and then we'll close the day. So enjoy. Well, it's always hard being the last one and um, keeping you from what will probably be a rather large glass of wine. Um, so we will probably keep this shorter and sweeter than what we initially planned. Um, I'm Roxanne. I'm an organiser at the Grant um, Givers Movement. I'm also head of uh, grants at Battersea and spent um, over a decade at the Open Society Foundations leading some work on economic justice, which as a person from a working class background is um, a huge passion of mine and, and I think sort of um, shapes the way in which I think about grant making and how we do that well. Um, the Grant Givers Movement is an anonymous group of grant makers predominantly based in, in London and around the UK. Um, we have around 400 members um, now and these are all people who are using this space to think about good grant making practice um, and what needs to be done to be able to position us as a sector to advance sort of positive change um, on some of these pressing problems that we've already discussed today in, in society. Um, but I want to introduce you to our three panellists. Um, we have Alicia Pomels from London Funders, who's also um, a 2027 associate, and Callum Pethick, who is from the, um, the Blagrave Trust, and um, Mita Desai from the Young Trustees Movement. So thank you so much. And thank you to Joseph Browntree for the platform to be able to talk about this uh, topic today. Um, if you'd ever get stuck in a lift, these are three great people to be stuck in a lift with, if you can choose. Um, I think in, in preparation for this um, discussion, what, what I felt really excited about was the hope that um, sort of younger people bring to this conversation about how to do good grant making and how we need to do that to shape civil society um, in, in a really intentional way. Um, but I'm just going to touch on a few things just to frame the conversation before we jump um, into the panel. And this is really designed as an informal um, conversation between those who are trying to transform the sector um, through the lens of sort of accountability, equity and, and power. And for GGM, we believe that achieving greater equity is, is about restoring power and resources to, to those who are, who are affected in their communities and recognising actually that power already exists there and it's about building on that and backing that. And as was really well articulated earlier on by Fazana, this power is deliberately broken down in very specific communities through structures of colonialism, of racism, patriarchy and capitalism. And it's our responsibility as good grant makers and those in the funding sector at large to restore this, um, using the power of, of philanthropy um, in the communities and those who have been impacted by these wider systems of oppression if we do truly change, stand for the change that we want to see. 
The Grant Givers Movement um, has produced sort of three broad reports on various different issues within the grant making sector over the last few years, um, most recently on, on ethics in philanthropy, but also power and trust as well. And, and there's just three sort of broad themes that I just want to pull out and briefly speak about. The first one is about the sector not knowing enough about the origin of its wealth, so the ultimate origin of its wealth, not the wealth comes from an investment. Um, we're talking about how is that money actually invested and who is exploited along that journey or has been exploited. Um, and our research showed that the majority of respondents could not identify actually the ultimate origin. I think it was over 80% couldn't do that. Um, they couldn't identify the ultimate origin of their organization's wealth. Um, and I think you know, Marlene was talking earlier on today about money stories, and I think this is what's missing in many trusts and foundations in the sector. Um, Joseph Roundtree's work on the origins of wealth and reparations was one that was continually highlighted by, by respondents to, to the research. Um, and most respondents believe that where organisations were found to have benefited from wealth, um, through these harmful and exploitative practices, they should make uh, reparations. And what do we mean by that? What does that look like? Um, that means publicly declaring uh, your origins and using that story really to shape your grant making practice and your strategy. So both the how and the what. Um, and I wondered whether we could have a, sh a, sh a sort of show of hands as to how many people in here believe their organisations are currently doing that. Couple of hands. I think that goes to show um, that there is a lot more work to do in, in this area. Um, Another one is the redistribution of power, which remains, um, remains an issue. Just over 50% said that they felt that their organisations were making changes, whether those were small or, or, or large, to, to try and redistribute that power to the communities that are impacted by the issues they're working on. And again, a show of hands, how many people in this room think that their organisation is trying to um, transfer that power? So, so a few more this time, but again, um, a little bit more work for us to do in that area as well. Um, another area is trust. Um, this continues to be a major issue, trust between the funder and um, the organisation or the individual receiving the funds. And this was really shaped by this race to the bottom um, in terms of low pay in the sector, um, not paying what it takes to carry out work. Um, Applying punitive measures when things don't quite go to plan. Um, grantees often not wanting to bite the hand that feeds them. Or a lack of relevance on boards and lots of issues around governance that we're going to touch on um, shortly. And a lot of one directional learning as well. So it's been very, tr it's been very sort of um, transactional and very extractive, taking this learning from communities and lots of trusts and foundations actually keeping that for themselves. Um, and a continued lack of resources going to racial justice issues, as Farah has mentioned um, earlier on today. So these sort of three broad issues are, are things that the Grant Givers Movement um, are working on in various different ways, and I think very much sort of link in with so many different issues that are going on within the sector. And sometimes it can feel a little bit like we're all living in this very big storm. Um, but how can we walk out into the rain um, and still advance change? Um, let's talk to our, our panellists um, about that and, and ways that that can be done. Um, yeah, the first question I have is around sort of what do you feel are the key issues in, in, grant, in the grant making sector um, that need to be urgently addressed? And, and Alicia, let's, let's come to you first. Whew, I'll be here all day. Uh, <laughs> let's start with sharing learning. So I think at the moment, there's this big thing on sharing learning between funders, but it tends to be sharing good practice. Um, there isn't much around the mistakes that are made. Um, trying to learn from the mistakes. I think 
it tends to always be a very pretty picture. This is very easy. Look at the you know, lovely wall that's been painted in Lambeth and there isn't the kind of the brutal honesty that, okay, this thing that we've done hasn't worked. How do we learn from that? So that other people and other funders can also learn from that. Um, this whole issue on risk and trust. I mean, when a funder makes a mistake, we don't then go, ah, we're going to boycott that funder and never work with them again. And there's this inherent thing of these marginalised organisations that when they make a mistake or they're we automatically assume they're risky because they haven't been around for a year or they haven't had a certain turnover. We then don't want to work from them, but sorry, we don't want to then fund them. But then how are they how are they ever going to get better and get to that standard that you've put out there if you don't fund them and if you don't give them a chance? Um, I see funders making mistakes all the time. They fund wrong, wrong things or they fund things that are not, that might be a bit controversial. Organisations don't have the means to then say, OK, we don't want to then take their money. You're forced to, right? You still have to go and get funding from them. So, yeah, I think that needs to change. Um, the language in the sector, I mean, I've been in the sector for about eight months and the jargon is just wow. Um, civil society, third sector, it just runs on, I think it's very, it excludes people, right? People are trying to come into this, trying to do really good things and if there's a million different words for one thing, you're just reinforcing all of the things we're trying, we're saying that we're trying not to do. Um, EDI is just thrown around now. I feel like everybody has it in their strategy, but what are you actually doing about it? Are you actually trying to be equitable? Or are you just saying you're trying to be because it's the sexy thing to do at the moment? Um, same as lived experience. I mean, I see it on job applications. It's a desirable to have lived experience of X, Y, Z, but surely that should be essential. It's not something to be desired. If we're going into, if we're trying to actually create change, then the people that are going to actually do the work and that are going to make those changes happen are the people in the communities with the lived experience. Um, patience is another one I hate. We should be patient. These things take time. Conversations take time. Whilst I'll agree, um, COVID happened and you all did it. You know, you got the funding out there. You, you kind of, you know, you broke down all those processes that you've had around for so long and you, you just did it. So I don't understand why that's kind of reverting back and, and it, we're just, we've gone back to this kind of 50 page applications and a million things on monitoring and learning that just sit at the bottom of your drawers at the end of the day. We, there's crisis all the time. It might feel like um, there isn't, but I think COVID, because it affected every single one of us, it, it didn't matter what race you were, it didn't matter what part of society you sit in, there was just this real kind of, okay, let's just get this done. And now that COVID isn't as in our face, it's like that crisis of that child over there in that little pocket of, you know, South London, that doesn't really affect us because you know, it's far away from us. And I just think there needs to be this constant, we can't just be patient, like we've got to get this done. Um, and I'll stop there because I could rant about this forever, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. And, and Callum, any thoughts on this? Um, I think for me, there's like th three main things that are like key key issues that like, I've, I've worked in the sector for kind of, 18 months formally, but I guess kind of, yeah, throughout my whole life through kind of, yeah, pro like, be, like being a service user of charities and then volunteering and then campaigning and organizing, like working with funders and then now working for one. Um, but yeah, the three things that for me is like mindset and culture of the sector, um, the lack of real proximity um, to kind of communities on the ground. Uh, and finally, a lack of true accountability um, between um, kind of funders and those communities. And I think that's kind of been spoken about by different speakers throughout the day in different ways um, in pretty much every single panel. Um, but in terms of kind of, yeah, mindset and culture, I think kind of thinking about the communities of young people that 
like at Playgrave we work with and we fund directly as well as kind of yeah through intermediary organizations kind of a lot of them couldn't sit in this space today and understand kind of a lot of the language that we've used um, a lot of them kind of today um, if they were brought into kind of any kind of board meeting would feel really kind of isolated um, and actually if we're wanting to really truly shift power um, and shift resources in the way that we want to, actually we need to model that internally. And that means kind of creating safe spaces, um, both in terms of when we're convening, um, but also in terms of kind of organizations. Um, if we're gonna have lived experience, like leaders in our sector, kind of the buzzword of now, then what are we doing actually as groundwork before that and groundwork after that to ensure that actually there's retention, actually power is shifted, um, opposed to just doing it as a tick box exercise. Um, after that, kind of, yeah, lack, lack of proximity kind of is tied to that. Um, I think kind of as funders, we need to acknowledge that we're never gonna have true proximity to communities because we do have kind of that like gaze over the whole sector. Um, but there are tons of different ways that we can try and close that proximity. Um, that involves kind of acknowledging that kind of we don't have the answers and participatory grant making involving young people, uh, in my case, in the, the communities that you work with, um, throughout kind of design process, decision making process, monitoring processes and all of that is, is, is key to really understanding issues. Um, uh, and as well as that kind of um, lack of proximity um, in terms of kind of where our wealth comes from, kind of that's been talked about today. But truly, how can we ensure that kind of the communities that we serve, um, yeah, are in, tr in charge of that endowment, in charge of kind of, yeah, where that income sources are coming from. Uh, in sense kind of like with us, with the young people that we work with, kind of how can we ensure that we're funding them directly and giving them resource, but then we're not also taking that exact same resource away from them by where our income generation is coming in from. Um, and then, yeah, finally, kind of lack of true accountability. Um, like the funding sector, kind of one of the assets that we have is kind of the fact that like we, 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 ca we have the freedom to do quite a lot. We can be experimental. We have a lot of resource. But with that as well comes loads and loads of problems. And I don't think we'll ever get true accountability to communities um, until we kind of, well, well, ever really. But we can try that by kind of yeah, really reforming kind of governance, reforming kind of where power sits, reforming our culture, and kind of actually building kind of new kind of economic systems around um, kind of community wealth building at the grassroots. Um, but right now, like we're nowhere near that. Um, and I think that's, yeah, they're kind of like the three, three key issues. And I think even kind of the most like radical cutting edge organizations like are still kind of, yeah, still few and far between and also still so much on like a journey uh, and actually like there's so much we can learn from the wider charity sector and the community organizing sector especially about how all three of those things have done really really well thank you so much Callum and <laughs> and on accountability um one of the grant givers movements um, reports on, on power and trust showed that most people actually felt accountable to their trustees rather mm -hmm. than the community they're serving. So I think there's there's really so much work that has to go on in the area of, of governance and, and accountability. Um, Mita, how do you feel about the sort of main issues um, in the sector? Yeah, it's exactly that. Like, who are we feeling accountable to? Um, and how do we understand what good impact is? Um, and it ties in all the things that we've been discussing today um, from when Caroline Mason mentioned about how this stuff that we're doing is really messy. It's multifaceted. Um, we have lots of competing priorities and we have to make really hard decisions. Um, and understanding impact is not like a business where you can say, ah, oh, yes, profits have grown. We are now developing and being, being growing as a business. Like understanding impact is like a huge hard thing to start with. So how, how do these things practically manifest in the biggest issues that we're seeing? One of those is these measurement frameworks, which um, are, are just not fit for purpose um, and that are so kind of skewered and in these perfect tick boxes where, and it doesn't really take account or sit with the messiness um, that is at B. And what, and what that creates is really perverse incentives um, for the people who, who need to get that funding to work to that fund, get that funding and get more funding. And an example of this is um, 
an organisation who uh, worked with young people and surveys and the impact created this impact data um, and therefore these surveys were like really important and what the charity found was the biggest impact of increasing the scores was to do the surveys after lunch and put on a really good lunch um, and that's quite scary when we're thinking about like all of this energy going into like how are we going to get these surveys to be maximized let's make the lunch amazing let's get like really good catering because we really need to get this funding and when those surveys go to board level, it's like, great, we're doing great work. Those surveys go to the funders. The funders say, oh, great, you're doing great work. Let's expand your work. And it expands. Whereas actually at, in that charity, everybody who was working on the ground saw that there were really key issues that were being missed. And the organization was expanding way too fast. And actually the key things that needed to change, it wasn't a secret. People on the ground knew what this was and were actually trying to change the organization from within. But they couldn't do that because they didn't have access to the power structures at B. And the funders didn't understand that information because those tick boxes and those measurements were all doing good. So the question then is, like, what does accountability look like? Because accountability is important. Um, and that leads us to governance. Um, because if, if funders are, are to, to work and sit within this messy process, um, the question is not like, how do we create the next new uh, metric um, measurement framework that does this properly? It's like, how, how do organizations have the structures within their organization to feed up all of the um, knowledge that is much needed and perspectives that are much needed uh, to influence this? Um, and then it means that the data that is collected, because data is really important, is used more for transparency. Um, and then we can move away from, like currently you do see a lot of organisations having like one set of measurement to report to funders and another one to truly know what's going on. We can move away from that. And it's like the conversations that were said later, like, like let's go have more of these conversations where people, where organisations can come to funders and say, here are the bits that are real pain points and here's how we're messing up. And they say, hmm, interesting. Like, how can we explore this together? Um, because the focus is on having uh, that internal accountability. And then secondly, um, some of the, the ways that we're seeing this mad, uh, manifest as well, um, there was a lot of talk about not all, funders not looking to mitigate risk and have the lowest risk possible, but actually looking more towards how do we manage risk. Um, and the way that we, we manage risk is we can never truly know everything. There is always going to be so much unknown. And if we have these homogenous um, groups of people who are making decisions, our blind spots are going to be massively um, increased. So from that perspective is how, how are the people who are making decisions not having homogenous voices around the table um, and having diversity around the table from that lens and also seeing the benefits um, through, through that lens. Um, and what's really scary is when we think about these homogenous spaces, not having the voices that um, have the most relevant perspectives in those spaces to ask those really relevant questions not being there that's really scary um, when it comes to being able to manage those things and then finally like there has been an improvement in 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 spaces with more diversity being represented and more of the people they serve being rep represented in these spaces but what does it mean for those people to truly thrive in those spaces and i'd like to go into sci-fi now back into the earlier day conversation. Um, any Star Trek fans out there? Put your hand up. Any? Yes, Trekkies, do not be scared. <laughs> we are out there. Um, you <laughs> um, for everyone else, you can just feel way cooler than me. So uh, you'll know the, uh, the term where we are the Borg. You will be assimilated. Resistance is futile. Anyone know that, Trekkies? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure, thank you, yes, you are here for me and I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, everyone else who doesn't watch Star Trek, please watch it, it's great. <laughs> That's not what this is for. Um, so I'm pretty sure that boardrooms see this and use it as inspiration to, we are the board, you will be assimilated, resistance is futile. Because anybody who, usually the norm of going into boards is, oh my goodness, like I'm not good enough. The biggest thing we hear is imposter syndrome. And when we're experiencing that, what that means is that you are going to try to act like everyone else in the room. And what that does is it extracts that beautiful diversity of perspectives where you can bring your whole self to the space. Um, and it means that you're trying to be like someone else and it just doesn't work. It, it just doesn't work. Um, 
And, and it's really sad because it leads to people leaving. I've had, had so many conversations with people who are just like, I feel like I have to fake it till I make it. And we say, don't fake it till you make it, you already are it. Um, and then the people who are actually being them full selves, um, it was mentioned quite a lot of the time in, in earlier conversations, how people who are on the sharp end of exclusion are holding the burden of labor to change these things, which are exhausting, which are exhausting. Where is my grammar today? I'm just keeping you all awake. <laughs> um, which is exhausting and leads, leaves people to leave the sector um, and the space. There was um, a piece of research done by Ecclesiastical uh, with young trustees, uh, uh, on young trustees, and they found that t the reason why 20% of young people left boardrooms was because they felt like they didn't belong. Um, and I'm sure that matches a lot of the data within, um, within the sector as well, because burnout is a, is a real problem, and we see time after time um, great people leaving because there aren't the conditions where they can thrive. Thank you, Meta. Really appreciate it. <laughs> I'm forever going to be very alert to when I'm given surveys and, and the timing <laughs> of, that, of that comment. Um, back to Alicia. Um, what role do funders urgently need to play um, in ensuring a strong civil society? And um, what do you think um, is stopping funders um, from, from transforming? What are the roadblocks? Get out of the way. Uh, as, nice, as horrible as that sounds, but... I think somebody said it earlier about money being the mechanism. You just have the money. Um, let the communities do what they do best. It's as simple as that. I don't really feel like I need to expand on it. Um, more core costs. I know that uh, projects make you feel good. Uh, they help you to sleep at night. But if an organization can't keep their lights on and their uh, the water is running from the ceiling and the director is having to use their own money to fund the spaces that they're in. I mean, I know you can't, with core costs, it's not something you can show to your board and, and be like, oh, wow, look how, look how great this is. We, you know, we've given them lighting. Um, and it's not as, as nice as the, the, the painted wall or the, the gardening that's happening down in, um, in Southwark. But I don't see why we can't offer both. It shouldn't be a one or the other. It should be core costs and project funding. Uh, plug the gaps. I know that funders like to kind of go towards what is sexy in the moment, but there's so much more that needs funding. It's the same as with, um, with areas. Don't just stick to the area that you know. Um, I work in a, at an organisation um, where we only work with uh, funders that work in London and I see a lot that funders are quite happy to stay in specific areas because they've built those connections and those um, those connections with certain organisations and they don't really want to branch out and I would just say you know there's other places that deserve your funding don't just stay in what's comfortable get uncomfortable um, and also this is going to sound really cliche, but just care. <laughs> um, it would just be nice to see that funders genuinely care about the people. Um, sometimes I feel like the people at the very top are just very far removed um, from communities, which I guess is something that everybody knows or it's been spoken about today. But um, yeah, just just care. And the second question, sorry, was... About what, sort of what's stopping funders from transforming, changing their practice? Ego! <laughs> <laughs> uh, you want to feel good, right? You want to look at something and look at a really pretty picture or a video and feel good that your money has gone somewhere. But essentially, like what Mita was saying earlier, you don't know about all the nitty gritty, you don't know about the person that was crying because they can't feed their child, and you don't know about the, the people on the ground that are having to jump through the millions of hoops through all of your processes and your application forms and your eligibility quizzes just to be able to get 10K. Um, I just, yeah, I feel like ego is like the, the biggest thing. Um, and then on top of that, I guess, 
power, control. Um, I sat on a fund for a little bit and I had to, I'm not really a grant maker, um, but I sat on a fund and I had to um, tell people no, and that was really hard. Um, I left there feeling really rubbish because I was like, ah, who am I to tell these organisations that their thing is not good? And I ended up saying yes to everybody. And <laughs> um, yeah, that's probably not the best thing to do. Um, but I just, I couldn't say no because I felt like everything was good and everything was needed. And I hate when I hear, oh yeah, but there's not enough money. We can't, we can't possibly fund everything. You can. Um, you just choose not to. And I think the longer that we're in this kind of, this system, we get desensitised, right? Because then it, it kind of becomes like a robotic thing. We have to say no. So you start getting really nitty and gritty about little things like, oh, they didn't articulate this properly and they didn't say, okay, but, you know, everyone starts off somewhere. Um, and that's it. Yeah, I think the point that you made about care is is so important. I think a lot of us have have sort of observed that the bulk of the work that a lot of us are funding, um, challenging inequity, is carried out particularly by either interested staff or worse, is completely reliant on the emotional labour um, of staff from communities that are experiencing racial inequity, and are just there's just not enough support and recognition of that and active sort of steps to actually try and change that. But to create that caring environment is, is just so important. Um, Callum, any, any thoughts um, on what is urgently, um, what, what funders urgently uh, need, to, need to do in ensuring a strong civil society? And what are some of those roadblocks in, in achieving that? So um, yeah, kind of agree agree with like a lot of what you said, Alicia, and maybe a, a couple kind of uh, different opinions as well. Um, I think f like first and foremost, like funders need to use their entire resources and, and influence to ensure they aren't limiting people from creating change but aiding them. Um, and sometimes, yeah, that that kind of um, that involves stepping out of the way. But sometimes I feel that actually there, there is a role to, to play f for the interim anyway. Um, so like funders have immense status and influence, um, and I think a lot of funders like to pretend that they don't, but, but they do. Um, they have huge masses of capital, um, and from that power, um, and they should acknowledge this, but instead of kind of controlling that themselves, acknowledging it, and, and shifting it to their communities and, and leveraging that influence and power through their capital, through their historic connections, um, to really kind of create like that transformative change. Um, I think kind of part of that, first and foremost, funders need to get a lot better at listening um, to the communities they serve and the external environment around them. Um, and yeah, like what I talked about before, creating kind of that that internal culture to, to truly allow allow for that to happen um, and adapt in response to that. And I think a massive part of that is kind of stepping out the way once you start doing that work and, and feeling actually really uncomfortable. Like um, the organization I work for, Blago Trust, like we've been on a massive journey over the last five years of kind of recruiting young people to our board and kind of moving from what was kind of a quite a traditional kind of almost family trust but without family members to one where like half our board are pretty much young people, nearly half our team. Uh, and like that journey wasn't easy for anyone. It wasn't easy for the staff and the board originally. It's, it wasn't easy for like the young people coming in. Uh, and actually that tension, I mean, it's still there now and we're still on a journey and we're still nowhere near perfect. But actually like holding that tension is so Im important. Um, uh, and I think like that's what urgent is urgently needed is, is, is people to create that space f f for that uncomfort. Um, and uh, I think that there's still quite um, a lack of kind of resource as well going into kind of it was talked about at the start of the day kind of three percent of social justice funding, specifically kind of yeah funding kind of grassroots like community organising and campaigning, and like. If we want transformative change, new frontiers to happen, it's not going to happen in rooms like this. It's going to happen at the grassroots. And like, like a lot of the young people that I, I had the pleasure of working with, it like 
at Blagrave like, are on the cutting edge of kind of thinking kind of so intersectionally about kind of their work because they're centering their lived experience in everything that they do. Um, and kind of because of that, like they're rooted in their community, that they're, they're really creating kind of the transformative change in new systems, but actually like kind of there's still barely any kind of like funding that they can apply for um, because they don't look like charities, they don't look like CICs, they're non-constituted groups. Sometimes they're not even groups, sometimes they're individuals. Sometimes they're just like a massive collection of random things. Sometimes they're, yeah, yeah, they're all sorts of different formations, all sorts of different structures and movements. And I think the funding sector needs to move away from kind of um, thinking about kind of what is what is charitable funding, and as long as it's kind of meeting your charitable purpose, then, then what are the different works around? Because there are tons available. There's fiscal hosting sites for funding. Um, there's kind of uh, new ways to kind of hold accountability. Um, and actually, if we, we really want to truly kind of, yeah, lead transformative change, then uh, funders have to do qu quite a bit of the groundwork, of kind of like figuring out how can we do this within charity law, because there will be possibilities and ways to do that. Um, and I think, yeah, f finally, a, a massive issue is obviously around kind of governance and, and steward it, stewardship of kind of um, wealth. Uh, uh, and I think that urgently needs to change in terms of who's in boardrooms, who's in staff teams, um, uh, and who's in charge of kind of, yeah, all of the money that's going out, but all of the money coming in, and how kind of that all interlinks, and, uh, and how kind of community wealth building can be kind of built into kind of, uh, yeah, the philanthropic system. Thank you, Callum. Okay. Um, as you were speaking, um, it made me think about what do we actually centre in our decision making? And funders often have a very long list of criteria, um, but often legitimacy doesn't feature very um, largely on this on this list. And, and as you were talking about sort of what um, what is a charitable organisation or that needs to be broadened out. We have to have a much broader idea of what civil society is and the contributions from different individuals and, and organisations and perhaps legitimacy needs to be a greater factor in how decisions are being made. Um, I think another one, a really important one that's been touched upon is, is a constituency. Who's behind the organisation? Um, a lot of the issues that we work on are, are rather unpopular. Um, and if funding is going to a, a rather elite NGO um, with no constituency, um, how will the issue at stake make traction? Um, so I think, yeah, we, we cannot conflate the idea of civil society with this formalised NGO. We have to have a much broader perspective of who can actually make change and who is making change. Um, but Mita, um, over to you. What, what do you think um, needs to urgently um, be addressed by funders? Yeah, all the things that were mentioned. Um, oh, hey, hello. <laughs> um, and, and just building off Callum's point of uh, accountability is a good thing, um, a really good thing. Um, and there is lots of frustrated members of staff in the in the charity sector who are working to reform their organisations um, for the good and lots of incredible energy, but they get blocked so much um, by their own organisations. And funders have such an amazing role that they can play to really unlock that innovation. Um, and the way that they can do that is through having their service use, more of service users um, and people who have, a, have the lived experience of these issues um, in those positions of, of power and accountability. Um, and, and that will just be so magical um, in like really small nudging ways. Um, so um, for an example of this is actually with our organization, um, Esme Fairland funds us and uh, as part of our like kind of fun uh, funding process, um, they had a group of young people um, asking us questions and the young people asked us the most difficult questions <laughs> and actually really got out the places where we kind of like really sucked and we really needed to be a lot better and we were like, yeah, we, those aren't really great. But it was interesting that it was only the young people that picked up on those questions um, and areas that we really needed to work and develop and improve on. Um, so those soft nudges are also really helpful and having those powerful things, powerful things, um, powerful 
powerful ways to improve the organization and support them but also in in much harder situations as well i think we've all seen situations where an organization has just come out of with something and the staff have like whistled blowed something which has really shocked the organization um Pub, uh, has shocked the public um, and, and f people who fund them because it just felt like it came out of nowhere. Um, well, how did that happen? It happens because our governance structures are not fit for purpose. Um, currently, a lot of boards are there to be like, like, great job or like really not engaged with those nitty gritty, difficult conversations. Um, and whistleblowing is difficult when you are a member of an organization who is facing really difficult things like racism and bullying, but feel they can't whistleblow to the organization or to the funders about what is happening because they fear that the organization that they absolutely love will get shut down. So by having more service users in this decision making uh, and having um, governance structures that enable for nuanced conversations um, and, and sharing some of those mistakes that are being made. It enables us to, to work together to, to reform things. So it's quite magical how practical um, the change that we can make is and, and the reform that it will create. Thank you, Rita. Um, back to you, Alicia. Um, can you share with us some sort of practical actions funders must take, not should or could, but must take um, to transform the, the funding sector to distribute power, um, be more equitable um, and more accountable for what they're doing? Change your processes. Um, I think right from the beginning, just change all the question, un unnecessary questions you ask in your application forms, um, make it more participatory, try and get the people from the communities that you're saying you're trying to serve in the room. Um, yeah, just change the whole process basically, scrap it, start again. <laughs> um, <laughs> Share what I said earlier, share when things have gone wrong. We're not going to get better if we don't learn from our mistakes. There's nothing wrong with saying that you didn't do something well. I mean, we all do it. We do it in our daily lives, right? So it shouldn't be any different when it's, yeah. when it's funders in the sector, I don't think anyways. Um, be more honest about everything. I think in terms of like the origins of your wealth, um, how your organization is run. If you see something that you're not happy with, call it out. Um, I think a lot of people will, will nod along and, and kind of just go along with something because they're afraid that of the repercussions that they'll get if they say something. But I mean, you're there, you have that power, you're there for a reason. And if you don't say something, who's gonna say it? Um, you're essentially speaking for the people that are not in the room, right? So just take the chance. What's the worst that could happen? You could get fired, I'm joking, no. But <laughs> what's the worst that could happen, right? Um, and again, offer core costs, please. Um, black and minoritized um, organizations tend to be the ones that um, suffer from this the most. If you are really trying to be equitable and you have EDI plastered all over your web page and your strategy and you're not offering core costs, it doesn't make sense. Um, it's not just about the project, it's about the whole thing. They need to stay open. I can't count the amount of organizations that had to close down during COVID because they didn't have the basics like to be able to pay rent and stuff. So if you are not offering it, please start offering it you're not losing out on anything. Thank you. Callum, anything you'd add? Uh, yeah, I'd echo quite a lot of that. And yeah, I guess like just kind of um, like repeat kind of, yeah, like the sector won't change until kind of the role structures and people within it also change. So yeah, a part of that's about diversifying kind of people in terms of um, kind of getting kind of the communities that, that your organisation serves in, into those spaces, but also in terms of skill set, kind of the makeup of charitable foundation at the moment is just kind of grant managers 
and maybe now kind of investment managers as well. But actually, if we're wanting to truly like shift power, we need kind of youth workers, like radical youth workers in any youth funder. Um, we need facilitators that are from the community in any kind of community funder. And if, if you don't do that and you're saying you're shifting power, then arguably kind of I question that. Um, yes, like you can go to kind of third party um, organizations and do that. Um, but really, if you want to instill it within your culture, you need to kind of look kind of internally, what can you do? Uh, kind of wider from that as well, kind of um, what does outreach look like in terms of finding kind of new communities, new ways of funding? Uh, and actually, kind of, is current comms departments working? What would it look like to shake that up? Because um, kind of, yeah, so the structure of kind of departments, the roles and kind of job descriptions and how you, how you title that, and within that kind of how you can incorporate communities uh, and those with lived experience kind of in there seems like a really kind of easy to me and tangible kind of step that a lot of foundations can start taking. Um, uh, and then I guess kind of after that, like looking at your total assets in aid of kind of charitable purpose, um, kind of what's been talked about today in terms of kind of investments, um, like the young people, like like we work with in climate justice spaces, like how can we be funding climate justice and then also kind of have investments that are damaging our planet? Like it just doesn't line up. And and I think kind of the the sector in five ten years time really needs to kind of tackle these problems really head on if, if, if we're going to actually create true transformative change and, and all of it this kind of like shouldn't feel that abstract it's actually like quite tangible and, and like the roadmap feels quite quite like there is now models that are appearing and it's becoming quite a bit clearer. Thank you Mita anything you'd add? Yeah, just, 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 uh, just really echoing all of those um, statements that were made. It, it, it's not rocket science where we need to go, but it does require a really difficult mind sh mindset um, shift. Um, has anyone read the book Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow? Um, in that book, the author actually said, yeah, I saw a few hands there. Um, in, the, in that book, the author actually says if anybody is going to kind of approach diversity and inclusion and, and change things up, they have to use their systems two brain. So what do I mean by that? Um, systems one brain refers to you touch a hot tap and your hand goes, oh, that's a hot tap. I need to move it away. That's helpful. Um, systems two brain refers to when you're going to be approaching a complex maths equation and you have to break everything down um, and make a decision. Um, and because what we are doing requires such us to really tune into what we're th thinking and feeling and not letting that you uh, be uh, affect our um, our decisions um, but being aware of those things systems to thinking is so vital for for the way that we can make change um, because because we all really care. I mean, you all are here at 5.34 <laughs> after a long day of listening to things. I'm pretty sure that means that you all really care about this stuff and people do care. And often I hear like awful things happening in the boardroom um, of, of not just the funding sector, but lots of different types of sectors, whereas actually those people are all aligned in the same values. And I think somebody said it earlier today. Um, that if you start from a place of values and then you always center that in all of your decisions and um, we're actually much more aligned than we think we are so it's just breaking everything down centering um those things into our decision making and also giving ourselves um the space to, to care for ourselves because what we see often in is situations where people um are very much emotionally affected by something um so that a young person will come it up. Uh, the idea of a young person coming into a board, for instance, um, will throw up loads of like risk. I'm really scared. Like, how is this going to affect all of these things? Um, and then what that looks like and say is your systems one brain will say, no, I'm not doing that. That's scary. And then say, I think this is too much for a young person. They can't handle it. Whereas breaking down, okay, like what what do I actually believe? 
what am I feeling and going through all of those things that actually leads to really helpful decisions and what we're not saying is just believe in this um, without questioning it someone else also said earlier today um, that sometimes your biggest um, people who are opposed to you can become your biggest allies and we've actually found that at the young trustees movement where people who have been really against having young people on board have actually said things like well how can how can young people who have no work experience be in a boardroom and it's like right well everybody needs training and all of a sudden they're like oh yeah that's actually right and then the whole board gets training and they just see the incredible benefits of um like diversity and inclusion um and then they're, they're, they're much bigger allies but i'm going to stop talking because i feel like we're running out of time we're getting very close yeah we only have a, a few minutes left um I think your reminder to centre values is so important. I think organisations, they spend a lot of time constructing them, debating them, and then they go in a drawer and they're not actually used practically on a on a day-to-day -day basis. They're not embedded in processes. So I think that's something that we should um, all, all consider um, in, our, in our work. Um, Alicia, um, you're so articulate about the issues that are in grant making and you know, you're someone who's entered this space sort of eight months ago. Um, your no-nonsense approach, I think, is what we need. And perhaps it's because you're new, you're able to really clearly see what's going on. Um, I think a, a lot of us normalize a lot of this um, stuff that's going on. Um, but I was curious, just, you know, we've only got a few minutes, so, so just briefly, you've been part of the 2027 program, and I was curious, sort of very briefly, what, what, what has that taught you so far? As much as I love it, it shouldn't exist. Um, when I applied for it, they didn't even ask me my name. It was just like two questions. Do you identify as working class? And do you have a lived experience of working in your community? And can you share that? And that's literally all they wanted to know. Um, and for me, that was so powerful. I was like, wow, I've never applied for a job that's not wanted a CV, a cover letter, and, and all of these things. Um, but yeah, it just goes to show it, it, it shouldn't be here. We shouldn't, conversations about lived experience, I feel like shouldn't just be here now. Like, why are we only just talking about this now? Why is it I'm seeing it on every single job application now that it's, it's a desirable, it should be essential? For me, that just seems like a, it's just nuts to me that this is only just the conversations we're having now um, and that people don't even know about initiatives like 2027. I think it's been around for like four or five years and I'll go to someone and they're like, oh, we've never even heard of it. So, yeah. Um, what it's taught me, this is hard, this is messy. Um, you're going to feel tired a lot of the time. I feel burnt out, I think, every single day. I bring a lot of me personally. I'm in a lot of spaces where I'm the only person that looks like me. Um, and I feel like I have to speak for my community a lot and that can feel really draining and I think that it's comforting to know that there are other people that look like me on 2027 um, so if you don't have a 2027 associate get one um, I'm joking well I'm not joking but um, <laughs> um, yeah that's that's basically my learning um, and Callum um, you've worked for a long time with with young people um, why do you think they're critical for advancing change? Uh, yeah, I might be a bit biased on this as well, because I, I also am a young person. Woo! Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but yeah, young people, I think, bring yeah, fresh perspectives and a renewed sense of urgency for a lot of the issues that we're facing, kind of, especially kind of, yeah, thinking about the last 10 years, kind of my generation um, have been hit the hardest by austerity, kind of youth services, education, kind of CAMs and mental health, um, and like the climate crisis and all these issues in the pandemic all hitting us. Um, uh, and actually like young people are now mobilizing and they've had enough and you can kind of see it on the streets kind of um, be it through the countless like youth-led environmental justice movements, the youth movements through kind of um, the youth collectors that came out after like the tra tragic death of George Floyd for Black Lives Matter, um, and also kind of all the education reform campaigns off the back of COVID-19 and the exam fiasco. Um, kind of young people are, are mobilising and they're organising kind of arguably like 
creating more policy cut through than a lot of wider civil society. Um, and they're doing this kind of by using online tools and new ways of working. They're collaborating. Um, they're looking at things kind of not through binaries, but through an intersectional lens naturally, because that's the world that they've grown up in. Um, and I think kind of holding on to that kind of energy and, and bringing that into the sector um, through kind of recruiting young people, through getting young people on boards, through just funding young people and giving them the resources and letting them build their own communities of kind of wealth. Um, uh, yeah, is it, it could really kind of um, shake up and create a lot of kind of the new frontiers and transformational change needed. Thank you. And Amita, um, can you just briefly tell us about the Young Trustees movement and what led you to be, be involved in that? Yeah, so it's um, the Young Trustees movement is to, aiming to double the number of young trustees on boards so that they can future-proof decision-making, navigate uncertainty and reflect the interests of their communities. And what really led me to be part of that um, was when I was a young person on a board, I went through a lot of that process of, oh my goodness, I'm not good enough. Imposter syndrome, I think I might quit because I care about this organisation so much. Um, and then realising that there were so many ways that I could be in the space and was needed to be in the space. So, for instance, having uh, I'm dyslexic, so having um, a, a board paper which I can go through, like you, use audio, um, listen to the board paper instead of read through the board paper, enables me to participate so much more. Um, understanding why I'm so needed in that space was so powerful. And then later on, like meeting other young people who were on the sharp end of exclusion, telling me exactly the same story of how they were feeling marginalised just made you realise like how much young people were needed to thrive on boards. Mm -hmm. Plus all of the incredible like innovation that boards have brought to young people have brought to boards. Like when you speak to the the boards who have brought young people on board, like Blagrave, who've been completely transformed as an organisation, it is just pure magic <laughs> um, of what it can do to to an organisation. So I'm actually really like it's really sad right now that there the the number of young people on boards is is like under three percent but it's also exciting in a sense because it means that there is so much innovation that can happen and is really practically able to happen um, so that's what makes me hopeful for the future thank you don't want to keep you much longer from your glass of wine but quick flash word or one sentence just as a parting thought alicia get uncomfortable Woo! Come on. Um, <laughs> go to that webinar about race or colonialism or imperialism that makes you feel uncomfortable. Don't just send, you know, your grants officer or somebody else to bring back to tell you about it. Get in there, get uncomfortable, question things, be brave. That's like 10 words and 10 sentences, but that's what <laughs> I'm gonna leave you with. Um, yeah, I, I guess kind of agree completely with that. And I think kind of, I, the word that I take away from what you said earlier, Alicia, around, and I think like uh, Fazana talked about this as well, but just care. Yeah. And I think kind of you can hold on comfort and be really uncomfortable, but you can do that like in a way that's kind of centering kind of care. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think that's one word I, I'm taking away from today. How can we create kind of more care in our systems? Mm, love that. Uh, stay curious and use your systems too, Brain. Thank you, Alicia, Callum, Amita, and thank you all for listening. Thank you so much for finishing the day um, and, um, and for reminding us uh, just how far we might need to travel to get to some of these new frontiers that we've been exploring today. So a uh, really important session. Um, so I'm not going to try and summarise today. Um, my head is spinning. I suspect some of yours are spinning as well. Um, but just maybe noticing a few themes um, around language, both the way it has the potential to exclude, but also the need to use it. Um, very precisely for some of the work that we're trying to do here. Um, important theme around intention and the fact that we want to really set clear intentions together that cut across uh, boundaries and sectors. Uh, the need for depth and really thinking about scale in terms of depth as well as breadth. Uh, the need for operating across spheres and layers, so thinking about movements and place work and policy work and narrative all being in important parts of uh, the moment that we're in. And the need for plurality, not having a sense that there is a single winner to pick or a single path to tread.
Um, so just a few, a, few, uh, a few themes, I'm sure you'll have others as well. And I just want to reiterate the question um, that I posed at the beginning of the day, which is really one for all of us uh, in this room to be thinking about, which is where does this agenda need to go next? What work do we need to do to follow on from the conversations that uh, we've been having today? Um, and I'd love us to come back to that tomorrow. Um, and um, I do hope some of you are coming back tomorrow, or lots of you are coming back to tomorrow. We start again at 9.30. Um, we've got a really uh, special guest uh, in the first session, so I urge you to be on time if you're planning to come. Um, and um, we've also um, we'll, we've got sessions tomorrow. We're sort of playing with time a bit, I guess. We're, we're thinking about how to bring the future into the present. We're reflecting on philanthropy's uh, past. Um, and as well as that, we've got some, um, some, some kind of rapid-fire um, uh, panellists talking about innovations in philanthropic practice. And we close off with a session on uh, risk uh, impact uh, and, um, and, and measurement. So um, a pretty, pretty, pretty full agenda again tomorrow. Um, we have got drinks now upstairs in the Battle Bridge room. I wish I could say we were all going round to Amara's granddad's house, but I hope this is a good second, um, so do please stay. Um, if you're going to leave, please uh, drop off your lanyards uh, with the team upstairs. Um, and I think the only thing I want to say now is just a huge thank you to all of you. Um, it's been a complete joy uh, to be in this space with, with, with such an amazing crowd of people. And um, I'd also love it if you could put your hands together for all the incredible speakers, the chairs, the panellists who've made today what it is. So thank you for coming. Thank <laughs> you.